buddy. How was lunch? Good, great. Uh, like those Hello. cookies? Hello. Uh, great to be with you, Suzanne. I wanted to sort of think of a flagrantly obnoxious question to ask you because I know you're so good. Um, do any of you remember that movie Pleasantville? Remember, somebody raise it. You remember it was like a, you know, a, just a wonderful peachy kumbaya community and, and it was just sort of everything was great. And I guess my question is, as we think about purpose, making the world better, creating a kind of filter and frame uh, for people to contribute and be constructive, which sounds so good, are we creating a world of kind of correctness that we're eventually going to have to rebel against. How's that for a start? <laughs> Nothing like a softball question <laughs> just to open it up. Um, and well, it's very aligned with the, with the book that I'm currently reading on Audible. That's all the rage right now. Right. Uh, and not, of course, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it talks about market world, right? And about how market world, does anybody know this book? It, it's such a rage. Yeah. <laughs> you must read it. I'll think about it before I leave because it's really important. It's called Inaudible? It, no, it's, it's oh. in. I'm listening to it in Audible. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. I will think of it before I leave. If Yes. Oh, win, it, winners so take a non, all. Right. With the most difficult last name. Garagandas, I think yes, it is. Yes. Winners take all. Thank right. you very uh -huh. much. Kind of brain dead. It's akin to that I question see. where Market World sort of has all the answers. And I didn't see the film, nor can I remember names of books, apparently. Um, but I think there is a fair amount of, that I see, and, and probably I'm guilty of at some level, although I'm trying to really bring a lot of awareness to it, of, of patting oneself on the back at these events, uh, at, with the work that we do in the world, with our NGO partners, um, in, in the business sector in particular, and I think it creates a little bit of a bubble. Mm. Uh, that can be dangerous. Well, I actually um, asked the question just to sort of get us going, but I actually think it's actually very useful to get people because, you know, when you kind of look around the world, um, there's a lot that is not going right. Needles not being pushed. There are, you know, I, I remember interviewing Eric Fanning, uh, the openly gay former secretary of the army, yeah. uh, interviewing him about transgender rights in the military. And he said he thought it would be hard to roll back rights for people, and he was clearly wrong. So when I look at that, I, you know, I'm okay with a little tilt on the uh, this other stuff, just to put truth in advertising. Yeah. But you know, you're a sales force, and your CEO, your organization, has done wildly risky things on the rights front. Yep. Uh, and and I'd love to give you an opportunity to share with the audience what you you know give us two of the two or top three you know and include Indiana, please. But um, you know the things why you took the risks you did uh, on rights inclusion and. Some of these questions yeah i think the why goes back to the the, the busting of the bubble mm. really and to sort of the the original question around you know is it so rosy um and what can we do about it as corporations and why take a risk and a big swing like that so to start with indiana so salesforce is a um a customer relationship management technology company based in San Francisco. We are 18 years old. I've been there since the very beginning. And we always wanted to create this sort of new kind of a company that really made service, philanthropy, um, part of our core value. Was that in at the beginning? beginning? Yeah. It really was at it the beginning. Was. It I wasn't started, sort of adopted late in no, life. No, I started yeah. when there was 50 people in the company. Wow. We're now 35,000. And we acquired uh, many companies over the last 18 years, one of which was the biggest tech employer in Indiana. Mm. And uh, when we had, at the time, Governor Pence about to sign a bill. Now Vice President, in case you didn't Vice remember. President, yeah. Um, Pence, about to sign a bill called RIFRA, the Religious Information Freedom Act, uh, that essentially gave license to discrimination um, to various categories of people, our employees really drove that. There was really kind of an uproar from our employee base that said, this is not acceptable. We should do something about this. We're a company that stands on values. You know, we've had this one, one, one model, which is our philanthropic model all along. We're social justice. And we had never gotten into politics before. Um, and we didn't know if it was really appropriate, actually, for a tech company that was based in San Francisco. Well, it turns out 
all, you know, we are the biggest tech employer in Indiana. Um, our employees and what they care about really matters to us. And there will always be people on various sides of the aisle. But I think what we learned about that is as it relates to rights, which was your question really, th there is a fundamental human rights that we believe in as a company and that we will fight for as a company. And if there are acts of discrimination happening within our walls, outside of our walls, it is our um, duty really to act. And so we got out in front, we called the governor, we. Um, we really did a lot of work. We said we, our, our CEO who, who likes to um, sort of get out in front of everybody else sort of did this yeah, on a, he was on, sort of on a like, Sunday night. Yeah, he was sort of like on the ballot uh, yeah. yesterday, right? <laughs> Not really. Prop C was. <laughs> yeah, I know. Different conversation. But anyway, I, I just say that because it was a surprise to many of us. And he did like our PR person right. who was fielding calls from the New York Times and she was sort of like, I got to get you know, right back to you. But it was also a surprise to our HR director and that he said, I'll relocate anybody from Indiana that wants to move immediately. And so he is a great, and, and we will all get behind those acts. Um, but what I will say is, you know, we're getting better as a company and trying to navigate what we are responding to, what we aren't responding to. But as it relates to fundamental human rights, we absolutely have a role to play. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating model for those who didn't know it because you made Mike Pence sort of fold. And, you know, one wonders if he were to become president someday, could you reenact that whole um, uh, interesting drama? But, uh, you know, when I just referenced uh, Proposition C, you know, Mark Benioff, um, your CEO on the ballot, uh, many people may not know that Mark really put himself out there, helped fund and really sort of defended um, that tech companies should be taxed more to help solve the homeless problem in San Francisco. And Jack Dorsey of Twitter and lots of others went to war with your CEO. And so yeah. we're talking about tech companies and doing good. And, and so not to ask about why you did that again, but I want to ask about tech companies. Google originally in its early founding said, do no evil. Mm -hmm. And we are now every day reading about evil. We're reading about bad platforms that let bad things happen. And so I'm wondering from your perspective of being one of the clear do-gooders, are these companies ones we should be highly suspicious of broadly? Does the tech <laughs> community come with an amorality that we ought to worry about? I don't think so. I think um, what we have learned about platforms, and a lot of these companies that you're referencing are really platform companies, um, are that good people are developing great products and, and not really thinking fully about intentional misappropriation of use. So, um, there is a lot of work happening. Tristan Harris mm -hmm. is amazing. If you haven't seen his TED talk, you really should. It's, he set up something. He's a former employee at Google. And he set up something called the Center for Humane Tech. And he talks about the guy who is a friend of his who invented, who I got the opportunity to meet, who invented Infinite Scroll. You know, great thing in the beginning as the internet was coming online and people mm. were looking for all kinds of information. Now there's like, you know, mental health crisis for kids. Mm. Um, addiction, technology addiction. I mean, this poor guy like doesn't know, you know, he didn't intend to develop in that way for that use, but because it's so new in so many areas, we're really thinking a lot about as a platform company, what are different use cases that could go sideways now? And what do we need to, what kind of principles do we need to have to kind of guide us forward? Tell us a little bit about the 1% pledge. I mentioned that this morning uh, in another interview, impressed with what you're doing to try to get founders of companies at the very beginning or the, you know, the startup world to begin thinking about giving back and building that into the DNA of their, of their company. And, and you know, share with us about the 1% pledge because I know you're the chief evangelist on that. Yeah, it's great. Actually, it's three of us. It's us, a company called Atlassian out of Sydney, Australia. And there was another company who was recently bought by uh, CA that sort of stood this up. And these are three, on, three entrepreneurs uh, who basically took a... Per so the, the 111 model that I referenced earlier is Salesforce's brand on philanthropy, mm -hmm. which is 1% of our time, 1% of our product, and 1% of our equity mm. slash resources goes back to the community. 
to make the world a better place. We like that model. Mark's a brilliant brander. Uh, and we like it because every company has those assets. Everyone in the room has those assets. Doesn't matter what you do, you can bring all of those things to bear. As it relates to the last one, which is equity. So pledge 1% is really holistic. You can mm. do any one of those things. You could do volunteerism or you can do all of them or two of them. Um, what we've learned is the equity is really powerful for pre-IPO companies. Mm. And actually, some bigger companies are now taking the pledge as a way to help us. And I would encourage, if any of you here would do so, to help us like legitimize this movement. Because in startups, if I just take a couple examples, a couple IPO examples from the last year, 18 months, DocuSign, Twilio, and Okta, three companies I know really well. The three of them, because they put a percent of their pre-IPO equity aside before they went public, and they did it at different stages, like... Twilio was series E. And do they put it like in a little lockbox or, you it's know, a, you know, it's an agreement, lockbox, right? Yeah, so it's a donor, right? advice, a donor advice fund. Right. We use, they use Tides Foundation. Um, and they basically said, we will take, they stage it over three years or five years. So it's not super dilutive. The venture mm -hmm. capitalists actually don't care anymore, which is great. They really did. They, they were really against it eight years ago, but now it's shown to build a great company. So just those three companies alone have generated somewhere around $200 million in net new philanthropy, just as a result of their IPOs. Wow. So we have 6,600 companies that have taken the pledge. Shockingly, 70% of them uh, pledged equity. I did not think it was gonna be that high. So um, our, we're just trying to like create all of us that are in this field work with our ecosystem and entrepreneurs that we know to say, bake this in early. Nobody's ever regretted it. You're going to get great talent like that. You know, one of the things I'm interested in has come up a lot, I think, in today's forum, but also other things. As I told you, I was just in uh, Lisbon at, some of you may know, the Web Summit, um, interviewed the head of environmentalism for IKEA, for Microsoft and others. And they all say that, that CSR corporate social responsibility is sort of yesterday's news and that today there's a kind of DNA ro reprogramming that that's much deeper, much more broad, much more in inclusive. And I'm just wondering, again, you know, looking back at the tech sector, what do you do? You, do you think that's as real in Silicon Valley? Because, you know, when I look at Me Too, I look at gender issues, I look at, you know, discrimination, racial bias, you know, a lot of the questions that are out there, even this homelessness fight in San Francisco, you have to ask, OK, where were they over the last 10 years? that yeah. you have all these inequities um, that have built in. So, you know, now we're all waking up and saying, oh, you know, people have purpose all of a sudden. <laughs> so it, it makes, you know, again, a cynic like me wonder where, where were you before? And yeah. so I, you, you're, you're inside. I mean, you own more real estate in San Francisco or rent more, real, you know, you know how these folks are operating. So give us the, you know, the other part of this equation the, of, 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 the, of the purposeless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I or the think lost maybe, or the, uh, those that are trying to fool us. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, um, it's less of a sham than it ever was. I think we've moved past cause marketing. Okay. Um, which is, I, I believe we should celebrate, actually. And these companies that I just referenced, for example, they have many of their head of philanthropy work, report directly to the CEO. In other cases, they're run out of HR, which I think is actually sort of the heartbeat really for, for a company if, if done well. Um, I think the millennials are driving it. Mm. I believe that um, there, once we, once, you know, the internet came online in a big way, 18, 20 or just really two decades ago, if you think about it, and the iPhone is like a, you know, it's what, 10, 10 years old or something. Mm. Like we, we forget about the, the, the pace of change with technology. Um, I think that the this generation and this generation meaning the millennial generation which you will find you know swarming the halls of technology companies they only know a 24 7 work environment they are always on they've always been on they will always be on so they are driving like this i think human value called purpose to say i i work 24 7 and you know play like mixed in not in a nine to five schedule so i want my ability to manifest my um commitment to purpose at work i want to work for companies that make this a part of their dna and what i've also noticed about this generation is they're willing to do the work they're not there was kind of a slacktivist moment mm. um 
but I just don't see it as mm -hmm. much anymore. I mean, we'll run hackathons on the, like, you know, on a Thursday or, I, I refuse to do things on the weekends, but like, it's crazy. The people that, that are do you, super busy do, that do, come Does up. Salesforce have a big Chinese competitor? Is there a Chinese version of you out there? Uh, I don't know. Not really. Don't know. Not really. Yeah. That's a bummer. I'd have a really good question if you did. <laughs> um, Mark Benioff said, uh, something very interesting. He says, now here at Salesforce, we have determined that this ethical and humane use of technology, especially within the context of the fourth in industrial revolution, must be clearly addressed, not only by us, but by our entire industry. Thank you oh. so much. Okay, oh, we're back. We're back. Uh, is, is AI, Internet of Everything, you know, a world of interconnected stuff and software and, and sensors. And it really raises the interesting question of where people fit in. And I think this is another question about purpose, the social contract, the glue that holds us together. And, and rather than the, just is, looking at the issue of philanthropy or giving, what do you, from your perspective and, and, and your foundation, are you doing when it comes to Mark's concerns about a, the dangers to humanity, if you will, from this next generation of technological advancement. Yeah, well, it's here. It's been here for a while. It's in our pocket. Um, you know, the age of artificial intelligence has arrived and it's just gonna go exponentially faster. Mm. And what is, you know, it happens with every rev revolution, every change, the industrial revolution, et cetera, um, jobs change. So we're thinking a lot about the future of work and the you know there's been many reports that McKinsey and other have uh published that sort of says well there's going to be like the accounting jobs right like the data driven jobs are going to start to be automated right and some of the autonomous vehicles are going to begin to sort of put uh other kinds of workers out of work so they've kind of begun people have began to sort of categorize what they are predicting um, is going to go first. Mm. So I think what I'm seeing, which is really cool, and I actually don't run the foundation anymore because to your point, I realized that philanthropy was just one element of social change. I wanted to like pick it up and go really broad with it. That's like, who do we hire? Mm. How do we hire them? When their jobs change, what do we retrain them into proactively? Companies like IBM are doing great work in that area as well. Um, and really just trying to get out in front of, we have this whole uh, technology platform for us, it's called Trailhead, which is a, it's mm. a learning platform. And we've identified the top tech jobs and we make this learning really easy, really free. We have like coal miners in West Virginia who are now Trailhead experts and um, just trying to like stay out in front of the revolution as it relates to human beings and meaningful work, I think is is a role that we need to play. I want to go to all of you and for just a second, but I'm going to throw a curveball at you. You know, I've, I've been so impressed with some of what you have done on the rights front. Let's just take one area, transgender rights, um, yep. which are clearly being rolled back. If you had, if you were going to lay out a strategic plan to say, here's how we in industry and the tech industry can put pressure upon a political system to be uh, more enlightened on that front and, and, and to not roll back rights, what would you do? I think the first thing is, what do we do? Like we cannot say anything if we are not doing anything, right? So we have this whole thing that we just rolled out about a year ago about the, what is your preferred pronoun at all of our events. It says, you know, he, she, uh, they, right? So you put, so, and we have this big event called Dreamforce where we have hundreds of thousands of people. Huge. Huge. Like genuinely And like really huge. big not on like, your badge, yeah. it says, what is your pronoun? Uh. So like part of what we need to do is be that way ourselves and then take our values and commitments to our like ecosystem is sort of is the next step. And then as it relates to policy, um, again, we believe in fundamental human rights for all people. And, um, you know, if we if we need to go to bat for that and, and our employees are driving it, we we likely would. What an interesting discussion. Let me open up to all of you. Questions, comments here from, right here in the front. Nell. Sometimes the mics are on and sometimes the loud voice works. Uh, yeah. We're definitely not on. 
Nell Debevoise from yeah. Inspiring Capital, yeah. um, and, and really trying to get at this notion of how do we make all of these great ideas and, and initiatives at the top, and then the real grassroots desire for change from the bottom, right. institutionalized and part of performance reviews and management structures and day to day. So given your desire to bring it big, yeah. tell, tell me how you're thinking about great, that. Great, great question. Yeah, so we have, a, it's a great, I'm just coming off an executive offsite that I flew here from uh, on the red eye last night, and it's the top 50 executives in our company. And it was an operational review, and we had to report on our APMs and our and our metrics. And and in there are diversity metrics: how many females have you hired? How many people of various races? And we report on them um, to each other to the top 50 executives, and we look at where we have gaps in the company. So that's just one small example. Um, we had, but at that um, it's at that event, we also had our the new head of philanthropy come and do a scorecard for everybody and says, this is how your team is doing as it relates to volunteerism. So we bake it into the metrics of the executives. Uh, yes, right here, somewhere. So, Hello, so and you And tell said, us who you are, hi. My name is Amos uh, from Hack Summit Labs. So you said that you think cause marketing is dead and I find that kind of curious when some of the most successful campaigns recently don't seem to have as much substance behind them. So Fearless Girl, for example, has won so many awards and yet came from a company that was found by a court of law to pay women less than men. And even Nike's Kaepernick campaign, which I thought was amazing, their organization actually funds the GOP just as much as they fund Democrats and their employees overwhelmingly donate money to Republican candidates. So it seems to me that a lot of the stuff that's happening right now is still very much in the world of cause marketing. So Great. It's beyond cause marketing. Yeah. I think it's just like, it, and what used to happen was it would be like one company and one nonprofit and off they would go and it was not collaborative or inclusive and it was Avon breast cancer and that was awesome and they did great things in the world and I'm not dissing that. I'm just saying it has gone so far beyond that and it's not driven often by the marketing part. It doesn't mean that sometimes it's not. Um, but I just see it going so much further than it used to. When, and I, I like in terms of how you hire, how you structure, how you operate. So, so just in closing, let's make a little news. How big is the rift between uh, Mark Benioff and Jack Dorsey uh, now after the Proposition C campaign? I know Chuck Robbins of uh, Cisco supported Mark Benioff, supported uh, Proposition C. Many other tech CEOs didn't, and this was about trying to put more resources and muscle uh, in dealing uh, with the homelessness problem. You had Amazon in Seattle that try and killed what they were doing, the similar version. So I'm just interested in whether a new battle lines have been drawn on that become permanent and divisive in the tech community? And is there now a white hat and a black hat in the tech sector? I'm I sure you're going to so. make I mean, we it. won the proposition, yeah. so we're happy about yeah. that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Mark and, and, and Jack will remain friends. Um, but it's, it's part of, I think, that culture a little bit is to sort of go after each other. But um, I always... I always see a month or two later, everybody's sort of back together. God, you're so nice. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Suzanne DiBianca yeah. of Salesforce, Thanks. thank you so much.